Okay, so thank you. Thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about the plan balance based upon course, particularly the work which I'm responsible for that I've over uh, in fact 20 years, and I've been involved in that for over, and so as a for, for 50 years. Um, Kieran Burke made a very nice perspective recently, uh, noting that EFT is, and I think we all agree, is a fantastic success. And one of the few cases in science where the thing just keep going up. I think most things have sort of come up and come down again, and there's two exceptions apparently, that's uh, EFT and silicon. And it will be interesting which one uh, survives the longest. But nevertheless, this is really a, a, a thing that is taking off, and I, you know, you can see that you know it's a big field, but uh, uh, the Nobel Committee was not entirely wrong of, of seeing the potential of this this thing here. Uh, and EFT with something like LGA or GGA does a fantastic job for a lot of problems that are what we call dense, uh, which means that they have a high concentration of electrons, think about a metal or something like this, or think about a, you know, a solid, something like this. Maybe you shouldn't think so much about surfaces because they, you know, they're somewhere in between of having a high density and leaking out into the, to the state, but they're even understanding of what the limitations could be there. But then there's this other class of materials, and all of them should say also that the reason that, the, the fact that PFT does so well with these sort of traditional approximations means that it is very, very useful, certainly in materials. I think Kieran has added this total number of citations to BFT. The green ones here are citations to BBE. The blue one there is citation to B3LIP. And of course, if you come from our end of the wood, we would still count to the you know, there is a little bit of a hybrid in there, so maybe you know, part of this is actually EFT plus something else, but pretty much it has meant a really revolution in how we're doing science in many, many of these different ways. And it does seem to keep going, uh, and that's fascinating. But there is this area over here, which is in fact an even larger class of material where some of the bindings are weak, or where there will be some regions with low electron density. There will be what we could sparse because there's some regions where you have a low density of regimes, and most prominently, you might have that they can be important. It could be between two kinds of binding, molecule or surface, for example. And uh, for that, uh, LDA and GDA does not do so well, and that doesn't do that for some fundamental reasons. Uh, and then the question that, that a lot of us has actually been asking is is must we really stop DFT before we get to very relevant sparse matter? Uh, and let me point out that any molecular matter is in fact sparse. Because a molecule is defined by a group of nucleons sharing electrons. So if you have two molecules, there must be a region in between where they are not sharing electrons, otherwise it would be one molecule. So that means that all of the organics is basically up there. And it's a huge class. And of course, if you ever want to go into some kind of biology or something like this, Molecular recognition is extremely important. Uh, any of these things here, they fundamentally rely on the fact that nature stores your genetic code, which means that you never ever have a chemical reaction. Otherwise, you'd be dead, right? We stand here 60 generations after the genes that we get from our parents. We're going to have 60 generations of cells in me, and they're exact copies. Every cell has exactly the same gene. No industrial process coming even close, and the point is that nature never really uh, gives away this bit, one molecule here and another molecule here. So these are really important questions. And I think that uh, nowadays I want to sort of point this out. I think that there is a huge. We have been trying to do this for 15 years, and there are many other people who have been trying to do this. Uh, and so a larger and larger part of these are actually citations to what you call sort of key sparse matter VFT calculations. Rises exponentially, and, and I think that in 2012, there was about 1,500 papers to sort of key citations to, to uh, sparse matter VFT, some of them being the Rorke Shalmas and the Now, <coughs> with this kind of title, I really should introduce it, the, the object a little better. Uh, it is a method for systematically calculating the exchange correlation energy going systematically beyond LDA and GDA, 
In fact, being a very, very close relative of those two things, it is, in, you know, enforces the conservation rules and the seamless, the seamless integration and so on. The point is that it gets non-local correlations beyond what you can capture with something like LDA. Uh, I mean, there's other nice things about it which I'd like you to, 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 to get an impression of during this talk, for example, that it's non-empirical. And it really uses these physics-based constraints to the maximum extent by a recognition of what to say. And here's really a typical example. This is graphite, the sheets of graphene, which is really a good example of a sparse matter. So in here, in these sheets, you have very high density of electrons, and the plasmons, which is really the foundation of something like LDA and GTA, are free to roam down these sheets here. The problem is that in between these sheets, the problem for traditional approximations, is that in between these sheets, you must pass through a region of very low density, a sparseness. And then these, well, if you want, the plasmons cannot really propagate there. So the foundations of having a single plasma-based description like LDA and GTA really is, doesn't really capture what happens when these, two, when these things start copying electrodynamic. And so that was one of the first problems we solved. Uh, <clears throat> we have extended, we're doing a lot of things in graphene, of course. This is an example which we particularly like in some sense, very new, uh, because we've got high school students in there to do it. So back to then, we were doing this the hard way, a lot of calculations, and, and really a small problem. And now we can get high school students in, and in one week they can you know, learn enough about G power effects that they can do a calculations, and this happened to be sort of an almost scary agreement of experiments, and of course, I wouldn't vouch for that. This one actually got published, so this one week work, the uh, advisors had to do something, this was also it had to do a question helping with the writing. Uh, the largest problem of that was that they were celebrating their uh, high school uh, diploma when it was submitted, so it was difficult to get their approval. But, uh, but there have been very many different, we coined the term sort of in 2001, uh, this kind of LSDF, and there's some key papers here, and I, we try to maintain a list where you can get uh, some updates on at least the ones with shallow places. The most recent version of it is the Thunderbolt Steel 2, which is also non empirical, and it, it can actually handle these, uh, uh, it can actually, it has better binding separations, uh, and uh, this is an example of being used in metal reactive frameworks that does spill over into technology, which I think is, is, is very nice. And it also does very, very well on the X22 reference set. Uh, this is chemical accuracy, and you can see that it really is doing very well there. <laughs> uh, but let me get back to, to sort of the more sort of theory of this, because that's where a lot of the recent work has been done, trying to sort of uh, see what we can learn by coding it up, which has not been done, and turning the method loose on itself uh, to go to the root of the, of the description. So typical sparse matter, like the graphite over here, combines strong binding in the sheets, well that requires the T of course, and then it has weaker binding across the sheets. And the, the issue there is that we normally think about that as an electrodynamical company. That's not electrostatic, it's very important to say that. Uh, <coughs> has an electrodynamical origin. And uh, well, you know, if you're just doing theory uh, without you know doing DFT, you know, that's not a problem because then you 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 have either a London picture where you have a, a temporal fluctuations inducing another uh, fluctuation on a neighboring atom. And then the, the, in, the coupling between these two would generate a lowering of the energy, a lowering, if you want, of the coupled mode of those oscillations, and you have a binding mechanism. The issue, however, is how you get these dynamical charge fluctuations back into something like ground state PFT. And, and, and so, you know, there, there's been many years of misunderstanding about this. Uh, but also, uh, people who in the late 80s have been working on this, uh, and, and for my idea, there would be uh, Langford and Lundquist, but there has also, also been others, uh, Langford and Pascal was working on this, and certainly also, you know, I should mention, Ashcroft. Oh, I, and by the way, for, for, for future reference, I do need to say that already back then, these pictures of the London forces or the Casimir forces were actually proven to be equivalent by a nice uh, argument by Jerry Mayer, which actually plays a quite interesting role in this thing. Uh, anyway, so we have this London picture here, but how do we get that into something with the density? And I guess in terms of physics picture, 
uh, Rathkewitz and Afcon actually said this perhaps the clearest. They said that the exchange correlation hole of each electron is also a local oscillator. So you can see I just basically moved this picture into the electron gas. All right? So the electron surrounded by the <coughs> hole stands oscillating. That's the, that's the exchange correlation hole on LDA and GGA, described by those kind of plasmas, which we know from 40 years and 30 years at least of DFT calculations with those functions. Uh, now, that, 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 that is sort of the key thing, and then you get a zero point motion shift. This is a new idea, it kind of supplements what was done earlier with Hopfield uh, with Anderson and Mayer, when they looked at excitons. And of course, this would be like also based, and the new thing here is that it sort of puts a stronger link to the next thing. <coughs> now, they also say, all of these people say, that it's very relevant because these are not just the statically screened thing, which would be screened out by metal gas, these are dynamically screened, and so you get an effect. Uh, you supplement that with the adiabatic connection formula, which is just basically the linear response theorem, that shows you that you can always get the exchange correlation energy a fundamental part of PFT by doing a control integral over, over, uh, of, of this response function. And it is known that the plasmons that give rise to the uh, local density approximations also give rise to a surface energy shift by actually looking at what happens on the surface. So that gives you some kind of inspiration that by looking at this response, you might actually not only get sort of this renormalized surface energy, but even this kind of coughing. So we're set to follow the plasmas. Why an argument that I don't have time to go into is that in fact we don't want to study the plasma with the LSDA. We want to study something with incomplete correlation, but that's fully possible. And so we end up actually building this non-local functional up basically starting from some characteristic plasmas that characterize the semi-local exchange correlation. That's what we do. And we can't see a point energy shift by a formal argument. So, as always in these kind of constructions, we pick a TGA, and we actually pick one that was very repulsive, because we, don't want to, we didn't want to be a double counting, that was the ref 3 be. Uh, and we, you know, we picked it for that reason. Uh, now, then, because we now have this correlation part, we keep exchanging correlations together, it's important. So when you do that, you can actually say that this must be based on plasmas. It's based on plasmas for the local part, and it's based on plasmas, or rather the coupling of zero prime motions for the non-local part. And that's it, that's it. But then there's this, and then there's the kind of of 2 which basically goes back and says, well, this thing here, where, where, you know, was not necessarily the best choice, uh, looked at again in, in construction of saying how should it look like. Uh, made a better choice, we think, actually, uh, for molecules. And, uh, and then also made uh, you know, a re analysis of, this, of these plasmas. I collected all of the pain in one slide, not really knowing what people wanted here. Uh, so, so bear with me. Right? Now, what I've done is I mean, the, the method is very, probably not too well presented because it's been sort of few PRLs, and then the longer method that was more interested in the, in the exchange correlation potential. I reformulated it, and I reformulated it in a way so that you can actually see explicitly that we are counting the shift in the zero point energies of those plasmas. Now, that's in preparation. It goes back to it, it, you snap this link, this formula here, and actually the cash flow filter. You have a susceptibility, and you worry about the density at some modified lambda. Uh, the adiabatic connection formula, which is exact, is actually used to pick a dielectric, a scalar dielectric function, so that you, you actually have this equation there. Uh, <clears throat> and so the assumption is that we can pick something like this and it be a plasma O, but there's very good tradition in BFT that you can't do that. And then you work out what would be, you know, you basically kind of take Linhart's screen up and you give it another twist, and out comes some, at this level, in principle, exact formulations of the ACF. Uh, and at the end, you need to get these non-local correlations, and you expand it as something that we know from the LDA, and we said generalize to the GGA in terms of the fluctuation propagator. How should this look like? And then we're actually linking everything back to the exchange correlation. Once you've subtracted off the two molecular contributions, which we're assuming you can describe with a GGA, 
you get a term like this, and you can see basically you can have subtracted off the GTA of this guy here, or an approximation for the GTA for that, and this is the graphene, I've subtracted that off. I get a term here, and you can see if I even keep on expanding that, we get a, a quadratic term, and that would be our non-local correlation term. Um, in this, uh, this thing here is slightly more general than the, uh, the approximations that we end up doing, because we actually expand these also in this part of approximation property here, so that's not good. So now, we end up with something which has a density, density that's for the two plasmas of the, of the two exchange correlation holes. Similar to exchange correlation hole, one there, one there, or that's, that's the most important one. Uh, and then we have a kernel which has a complex dependence on not only the density but also the gradient of that center of the graph of gradient there. And we very parameterize those in terms of some parameters, and you know, that's all worked out in terms of the exchange correlation hole. And I want to say that this is a non-trivial universal kernel. Okay? It's a universal kernel, but it is not a trivial one. Now, it's a trivial one would be like the one we have in Coulomb. The way we can test that, we've recently done that, is actually to start out and cutting away all the low density regimes. Just keep drawing away from the bottom up. And then if you had a trivial kernel, if you remove 2% of the directions, you would have lost 4% of the interaction. <laughs> now, and so on, right? If you remove 50, you, you lose a lot of that. Not a lot of the okay? That would be. You see, the way this is written is actually it's not important how many elections there are, it's where they are located. And that's all built into these exchange correlation holes. So, when you do this and you just remove 2%, that's like this Arnold's contour here, you're actually losing 15% of 4% of the interaction rate, and so on. So it is strongly aware of where, where, where the elections are located. And I think this, this point we've not really managed to get across before. We don't just, I mean, in fact, what we end up doing is that it's that region in here that's critically important. And in fact, when we do it self-consistently, which we can now do, we actually have here an electrostatic signature of how this kind of last one looks like. Now, uh, that's very important, because the Born Oppenheimer says in equilibrium, that forces must be in equilibrium, forces must be electrostatic. So this also means that we must be able to represent that kind of volume in terms of if you want Nevada signature, but it's actually much more general. It has to be a change in the density. We have those kind of changes. That's one part of this talk. Uh, the other thing is I just want to say that it's useful. And one of the things we are moving increasingly into is, is the region of coupling our prediction for atomic structure into the consequences for the optical spectrum. One, one project here that we were quite happy to be part of addresses the self assembly on a couple of normal surfaces of some organic molecules. And part of the argument is a thermodynamic DFT argument, actually, but part of the argument <coughs> is also knowing how much does the absorption change the, the actual surface state. This is a fractal system. And uh, the green dots here are the calculations from Fundamental DF2. And then down here would be the, the, the measurements over. Uh, I think it's, it's either the advanced light source or the other one over there uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, now, people, a, a friend of mine is here from Malibu. Uh One of the other reasons that we are very happy uh, about looking at is, is actually the frustration between heads and tail. So that if you anchor the molecules on the surface, then you might think that the whole thing is dominated by what the PBE would be doing. But in fact, the kind of valves contain can really change this. And of course, that also might very well change the electronic <laughs> functions. Uh, we are also looking into what happens when you actually try to use this for some kind of contact. You can envision of actually having a fan der Waals mediated contact. Uh, <coughs> I do not have time, I would love to have done this, is that I can actually give you an analogy of how this works by simply saying that you know this is a coupling of boson poles. Boson poles is zero point energy shifts, but there's actually an interaction energy uh, that, that we worked on with the interaction of basically interference coupling when you drop a couple of defects on our metal surface, each one of them sets off scattering in the surface state, something we've looked at. I can't go through the analogy here, it's actually a wonderful analogy. This is an old paper we did, uh, this is, these are the theoretical predictions, and the other ones here are the measurements. So we actually get, this is a non interpretive result, I think kind of, kind of important. So it's, a quite, it's not a perturbative result we're really dealing with here, neither in the Fandalas process or in the way we did these problems. 
Here I'm only saying that, well, what we can do with add-ons on the surface, we can certainly also do with molecules on the surface. And here we've done some decoupling of the Kronchamps, <coughs> not quite, so we don't get the, uh, the Rickberg series. But we did get much better things out here by doing some, some localization of these orbitals, <coughs> decoupling the states on the slab. And you can see that H1, the sorbent molecule of here, you actually do <coughs> create differences in the electron distribution, i.e. there is some kind of scattering over here. And so we speculated whether that couldn't actually give rise to some kind of corresponding interaction. Uh, turns out that on benzene and copper, you were finding two different states. You have something over here which is perfectly interpreted as if it was just lateral and lateral interactions. I understand. And over here, you have something <coughs> that, that is, uh, well, is, is this indirect surface mediated states. And one of them is actually an illustration of the other, but maybe that's a little too far. I've included some slides, some, some, uh, some references here to web pages that summarizes some of the work that we're doing in China. Uh, and since so slides will be available, we have those. Uh, <coughs> now I don't know where to go. I can go either, I think I will go with some ideas we have for large system calculations. Because um, one of the things that we keep saying, uh, and I think everybody in, in this field is saying, is that you know, eventually you're going to have to look at these biomolecular problems. And the problem there used to be the kind of asperges. And I would say that it's not anymore. Maybe, you know, maybe that's hypers. No. But let me point out that there certainly is another problem, which is the fact that, um, that you have this kinetic energy repulsion. Let me just say, though, that back in the, in the, when this all started, we did not have the exchange correlation functional. So we threw, as we I threw together an approximation scheme for this that was non self consistent. <coughs> and then when we got the self consistency, we could start. Uh, looking at one or the other. This is for this small molecular system reference systems. One is the quantum chemistry calculations. Self-consistency calculations is actually not as good as, as these approximations we were doing back then. It's kind of interesting. I think that's just Petrucci's errors. Uh, but we, we have found now that you know, there's been these accelerations, but there are these real space evaluations that for very large systems like these biomacular things becomes costless because it becomes overran eventually. Now, that means that we should be able to just do these. Well, we could use Fandalastia for those structures, right? Well, no, because you have this kinetic energy problem. So, okay, so in order to at least extract, motivated by the fact that we could buy with quite a good approximation back then, maybe we could actually, uh, let's say, lower the accuracy a little further and speed up the kinetic energy. So, we've been thinking about a superposition of fractional density, think something like Harris. But <coughs> it is actually a generalization of the term. Now, I think most people know that the hair scheme is that you calculate from one block and another block with high accuracy, you put them together, and then you do a one shot, a few shot calculation of the combined systems. And I've only drawn two systems here where this would really be relevant, would be something like super molecular complex. You have maybe a hundred different molecular entities, each one of them you do with TFT or whatever, because they would be small, and then you throw it all together. And you need some kind of, let's not do the full kinetic energy. Now, uh, we are trying to test if the Harris scheme would work with us. Let me get back to that. But let me also say that <coughs> if I take the C60 on a graphene sheet here, uh, the interface down here looks like a benzene ring. So already here you see that there's something, you know, that I can look at two different systems at the same time. If I do that, and I shall fact out that there will be huge differences between Fandalas TF1 in the energy difference in the non-local correlations, these two guys here. But all the other terms, not just the single local part of the exchange correlation energy, but all the other terms, the kinetic energy and so on, this space, you couldn't care less. You can't tell the energy difference between a benzene and a C60. So that gives some kind of hope on that the cone channel also are not particularly worried about anything but the interface. It's kind of like a semi-local approximation. And that means that we can actually, we think that we, we don't really have to have that high accuracy. I'll test that in a moment. So <coughs> we would like to combine this kind of Harris scheme that is you know, not high accuracy with this kind of non-local mapping. The non-local mapping having the advantage that it can carry information about charge transfer. Okay? So a parameterized you know, scheme will not know when you can charge, have charge transfer, which you have in biomolecular systems. But you see, a local automatically has that because it's state-based. 
Now, you know, ideally you'd want to do classical and D plus plus thing, but that would be problematic because you don't have the best thing. I don't know if I can say EMT, but some kind of approximative method here that would combine something that you know would give us an approximate kinetic energy repulsion, and then we would like to do the full thing with this. For now, we've just tested this kind of header scheme, which automatically gives you a speed up for the for the uh, thing. So we've tested it on their systems. <coughs> um, if I go back here, you can see that it really didn't matter whether I did the non system one, the one we did in 2003, 2004, or if we uh, use this sort of approximate thing of not actually preparing all about the kinetic head. You still get a very good correlation. Notice that this is not a lot of power, not mine, this is a Okay? Then we took this and we looked at DNA, and I took contrasted that with a carbon nanos primer. Here's our DNA, so we got a calculation of the electron density around that. We put it into a supercell, we start rotating one coating to the other, and we started out by, by showing that the, the non-local correlation mapping is very is, is very scales very, very well. So we could we could map out what would be the variation as you align it differently <coughs> to a uh, two DNA string set. What we couldn't do, which is a pain, was to actually complete the DFT calculations because we did not have access. I didn't think I got access to price, but then the, the Swedish negotiators converted that all into application support and I was left with. You know, <laughs> that was really a thing. Sorry about that, Chris. It would have been fun, but we never got that. Right? Okay. Um, anyway, so here's the contrast of this. And it's kind of interesting because you can actually see here, these are the calculations for, for the DNA. You see that the DNA, the way the, the, the atoms are, are aligned is that it really doesn't matter so much. These are approximations, so it's just built based on the morphology of this thing. <coughs> but you see that it really doesn't matter so much here whether you use a, uh, a some kind of parameterized scheme, C6 scheme. Uh, but if you actually go over here and look at the carbon nanotube, you actually see that the enhancement is much bigger. And also, there's much more difference between these two things. And again, this is because the electrons are distributed uh, differently in the, two, in the two different systems. So that's what we're saying. That it really is interesting to do some kind of simple kinetic energy, plus some kind of study of what happens to these non local things. And I think that one of the strongest arguments right now for using Fendelasti in the biomolecular system is that we are ready to have counter arguments. And I guess I'm I think I'm out of time, so yeah. So I'm just saying that if you add one electron to a helium atom, the C6 coefficient of that interaction rises by a factor of a thousand. <coughs> you also have these giant orbitals, the outlying orbitals. So when you start charging these systems, <coughs> they will really make differences in the kind of balance of And we think that, that would be a great place to follow it. And I guess, you know, we are looking, we're trying the higher scheme, we're looking for some kind of thing to you know, make cheap kinetic energy repulsion. You know, we're just after the probably exclusion principle. That's some of the ideas we have. Okay, thank you for your attention. I guess, that's right. I guess we can have a, one or two quick questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Was there something done with the in fact, uh, I think actually the density that we got from the DNA was done with G4, and I think the uh, the chloroform on graphene was done on G4, the one with the high school students, and the DNA density was actually done with, with uh, G4. And now that you bring it up, the reason we eventually switched for this for the study of the you know the accuracy of the hair scheme that we proposed in the modified hair scheme was that we could not define the superposition density and read it into a G power and get it to run. There's that. The other thing we couldn't do in G power was we couldn't prevent a Harris scheme from actually going completely bananas and giving us accuracy beyond anything we want, right? Same thing was actually true for the deep decapo. It insisted on giving us very high accuracy for the wave functions when we were on a Harris scheme. But at least the capital we got to run. We, we, we would like just to have an approximate evaluation of the kinetic. I don't know how to stop it. So I'm, you know, not being a coder means that I'm restricted in doing something. Okay. Nevertheless, we're going to speed up the factor too. What oh, sorry? So what do you think it What would happen is that if you could define, we can externally define it next thing. We need some kind of tool to read it into T-Power. 
We did actually submit a, a, a question on the GPAL uh, help list. We didn't get any response. Uh, so that's an answer to your question. Um, but, you know, if you could somehow, if, if you have a superposition density and you can read that back in so you can start doing these hair schemes in the original spirit of the hair scheme, we would love that. We would also love somehow from flag to stop the hair scheme from being so accurate. Yeah, but I'm sure this must be possible. <laughs> you know, it's like you know, it's giving us too much. Um, we we are actually now trying to control expression, and, and that's because we you know we, we know somebody can do control expression. But you know, uh, and I, I talked with one other person at the uh, at the, at the lunch that <coughs> I mean maybe there are some advantages of, of, of using the LCIO solver or something like that. <coughs> We all, we just hope that it will get used, right? 